just want to uh, you know welcome to everyone particularly to the speaker uh, Meera Srinivasan who I know has a very very busy uh, schedule uh, considering the fact that uh, you know events are moving at a hurtling pace in Sri Lanka right now I mean tragically and uh, she has to cover everything for the Hindu so uh, let me very quickly tell you what the title for today's lecture is which is, uh, you know, we weren't able to put it in the timetable, so I'm just informing all of you. It's called Continuing Turbulence in Post-War Sri Lanka. And it's continuing, as you know, turbulence has been there in that uh, island state for such a long time. And a short bio of Meera Srinivasan, I won't take up much time, I know she's been very modest. Uh, so I'll just uh, tell you what she has given me. Meera Srinivasan is the Sri Lanka correspondent of the Hindu over seven years across two stints. In these years, her reportage has looked at post-war reconstruction, prospects of ethnic re reconciliation, livelihoods, apart from coverage of key political, economic, and strategic developments during the time. But she has also covered events for the Maldives, uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, Mira is a quintessential uh, South Asian uh, correspondent, if you'd like, you know, foreign correspondent. And uh, before her Colombo assignment, Mira was uh, deputy city editor at the Chennai Bureau of the Hindu, when she covered school education and public education policy in Tamil Nadu and uh, urban infrastructure. She has a bachelor's degree in commerce from the University of Madras. And we are proud to add that she has a PG diploma in journalism from the Asian College of Journalism from the batch of 2003-2004. Uh, she later pursued a master's degree in elementary education from the Tata School of uh, Social Sciences, TIS in Mumbai. Uh, so here is uh, Meera Srinivasan to talk to us about what's happening in Sri Lanka. Go ahead, Meera. And you know, you could speak for a while and then we could also have an interactive session. But speak, sure, say sure. what you have to say because as you can see, students are very eager to listen to you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, before I start, I'll just uh, let you all know that uh, we are experiencing uh, power breakdowns and I currently have a power cut. So I am connected to the internet and should I get disconnected, I'll come back. Yeah, so okay. uh, bear with me for that. Yeah, sure, Amira, of course. So uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to meet you all uh, virtually and speak to you. And thank you so much to Dr. Nalini Rajan for the kind uh, invitation. Very uh, well. Thank you. So when you say Sri Lanka, what's on everybody's mind at the moment is the grave economic crisis gripping the country, one of its worst in history. I thought I'd first talk about this meltdown and its immediate repercussions, but also zoom out now and then to look at other key flashpoints and major developments in Sri Lanka's post-war years that may not be entirely unrelated to what is unfolding right now. In a sense, the post-war years that were supposed to bring peace have remained turbulent for many Sri Lankans, and that is why I suggested that title. I'll try my best to cover some key developments in the last decade, and I look forward to our discussion after that. And even while I speak, if there are any questions or comments, please feel free to interrupt me. You may already be following developments closely, but just to give you a gist, the current economic crisis began manifesting at least two years ago and intensified towards the end of last year. So you would uh, have seen reports about how uh, foreign reserves that were, you know, at 7 billion or so two, three years ago fell to nearly 2 billion. You know, in a sense, this is a balance of payments crisis. And that led to a severe dollar crunch. And, you know, therefore the country couldn't import uh, services, debts, and so on. So as this crisis intensified towards the end of last year, it triggered protests that are now expanding by the day with the call for President Gotabhai Rajapaksa and Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa and their entire family that's in office to step down. 
the cabinet of ministers quit last weekend in what you know is somewhat of a success for the ongoing uh, agitations but the president and prime minister themselves remain office quite stubbornly since you're all journalists i'd like to share one recurring challenge in telling the sri lanka story when the rajapaksas are in power i think you'll really sympathize with me uh, there were at least until recently five rajapaksas holding important positions this meant that you sometimes had more than one rajapaksa crowding your news report and potentially confusing the readers so in our second references to any rajapaksa now we stick to their first name we say mr gota by mr mahinda instead of using the second name and you know it's a departure from our style sheet but that's hardly the biggest problem of having many rajapaksas in power so let's go back in time a little you know a few years to see what sri lanka has looked like after the civil war ended in 2009 as you all know the civil war itself followed the sinhala buddhist majoritarian states violent discrimination of tamils tamil oppression was not confined to the north and east where they live in large numbers but also it played out also in the hill country where tamils of more recent indian origin reside and work in the tea estates of course the civil war itself was centered in the north and east and pegged to very specific political demands of those who led the tamil community at different points be it the old political leadership or the ltt that positioned itself as the community's representative later on or the current tamil polity representing them in parliament the civil war ended in 2009 it was a gory distressing end several thousand civilians were killed in areas declared no fire zones by the army several thousand individuals went missing or surrendered to the military and their whereabouts remain unknown for years now people's land taken by the military are yet to be returned fully and there are increasing instances of state agencies targeting tamil's land in the name of archaeological projects environment and forest conservation the economic fallout of those years of strife is still being felt in the widespread joblessness indebtedness in the struggle to revive rural livelihoods be it agriculture or fisheries which i will talk a little about in a bit i was posted to sri lanka by the hindu in 2013 my first stint four years after the war had ended the tamils call for accountability truth and justice for alleged war crimes by the armed forces was very pronounced despite military lingering in their areas constant intimidation and repression the issues would dominate U un human rights council sessions in geneva and you see some of that play out in india as well in tamil nadu's campaign in solidarity pressure on new delhi to vote against sri lanka and so on while i was beginning to learn more about these issues i confronted a story that has proved crucial to my understanding of nationalisms expression of solidarity competing livelihoods linguistic affinity and so on it became evident whose interests were protected and whose interests were compromised in the many assertions of people's rights i met northern fishermen mostly in jaffna manar mulaipeel who were desperately trying to rebuild their lives and livelihoods but just could not they were small scale fishermen using unsophisticated boats and fishing nets to manage a small catch by their coast but even that was becoming a major challenge for them because tamil nadu fishermen were routinely fishing along their coast using destructive bottom trawlers often damaging their sri lankan counterparts fishing gear and over time severely impacting the catch so here i was coming from tamil nadu where calls of just calls for justice for elam tamils are passionate and loud but also witnessing an economic and environmental calamity in the northern parts of sri lanka caused largely by indian fishermen that too from tamil nadu northern sri lankan fishermen are still bearing the brunt they are still asking for trawlers to stop they are still asking for tamil nadu fishermen to uh, you know resort to fishing methods that are less destructive This is only one of many complexities that drew attention in the north and east along with concerns over enforced disappearances as i mentioned land militarization and state repression 
Meanwhile, beginning 2012, Sri Lanka also witnessed a growing attack on the Muslim community. They are the other ethnic minority. Interestingly, the Muslims of Sri Lanka are also Tamil speakers, but identify as a different ethnic group. So these attacks came largely from Sinhala Buddhist mobs, at times prominent monks leading them, turning rather violent, as was seen in the anti-Muslim riots in the southern Alukkama town of 2014 and in Digana near Kandy in 2018. I'd like to now jump to 2015. And uh, I must say this is no exhaustive coverage of you know, these years, but I'm trying to just flag a few important moments that I think are useful to pay closer attention to. So what happens in 2015? Then two-term president Mahinda Rajapaksa suffered a shock election defeat to an unlikely eclectic coalition led by Maitri Pala Sirisena and Ranil Vikramasinghe, which people backed hoping for relief from the Rajapaksa years. It was a complicated marriage of political actors from the beginning, and the fissures appeared in no time as the Rajapaksas were waiting in the wings to return to the country's helm. The biggest structure in the Maitri Pala Sirisena Ranil Vikramasinghe alliance was in October 2018, when Sirisena abruptly sacked his prime minister and appointed Mahinda Rajapaksa in his place, triggering a major constitutional crisis that lasted over 50 days. Later, the Supreme Court historically ruled that the president's actions were illegal and the older political setup was restored. In less than a year from that time, the Easter Sunday terror attacks rocked Sri Lanka. It was absolutely unexpected. A network of suicide bombers carried out serial blasts in churches and luxury, luxury hotels in Colombo in a suburb called Nigumbo and the eastern town of Batiklo, killing over 270 people and injuring hundreds of people. Months later, in November 2019, Sri Lanka elected Gota by Rajapaksa to power. The former military man campaigned hard, promising national security and prosperity to the country that was still reeling in the shock of the biggest incident of violence in its post-war decade. He secured a resounding election win with about 6.9 million voters backing him, almost entirely from the southern Sinhala areas. The voting patterns revealed that Tamils in the North and East had emphatically rejected him. Basking in this whole victory, Gota by Rajapaksa sought to strengthen the powers of the executive further. He passed the 20th Amendment to the Constitution, reversing the small but significant gains from the 19th Amendment that was passed during the former government's time. He resorted to massive tax cuts and tax exemptions to please his constituency, which also included professionals and large businesses, resulting in a sharp fall in government revenue. In August 2020, months into the pandemic, general elections were called and the Rajapaksas consolidated power in the legislature as well, securing a two-thirds majority with their allies. Gota by Rajapaksa's policy towards minority was hardly conciliatory. He banned the Tamil national anthem from public events and his government objected to burial of COVID victims, creating enormous pain for the Muslim community. Meanwhile, the pandemic broke out in early 2020. The first economic casualties of this were the country's main export earning sectors, be it tourism, exports, worker remittances coming in mostly from West Asia. Stringent military monitored lockdowns for months delivered a blow to small businesses, shops and establishments, resulting in huge job losses and fall in incomes. In no time, Sri Lanka's foreign reserves plummeted to about $2 million. That's barely enough to pay for a month's imports. Let's remember that Sri Lanka is very import reliant, even for the most basic items, for example, milk powder. Sri Lanka doesn't have a, a tradition of dairy production that's robust. So it's very minimal and they largely buy milk powder, say from countries like New Zealand and Australia to service their basic need. So with this, you know, uh, with the foreign reserves dwindling to about $2 million, it immediately meant that, you know, your essential items are going to be harder to access for the general public. And with looming external debt obligations, now this year Sri Lanka has to service about $7 billion in debt. This was a clear warning sign for the government. On the one hand, 
your foreign reserves are dwindling and then you have this huge debt obligation coming up and you have to pay for your import bill. The island nation clearly did not have enough dollars to pay for the most essential items that it sources from these different countries. And in May 2021, Gota by Rajapaksa banned imported chemical fertilizers in an attempt, in an attempt to cut uh, the import bill. And it meant an abrupt switch to organic farming for the country. The move was pitched as something that would reduce the import bill, but experts warned repeatedly that the government was making a mistake and the consequences are going to be very severe, as we see now, uh, because it's a likely drop of 50% in annual yield forcing the government to import more food. So it's an irony. On the one hand, he cut chemical fertilizer import, thinking it's going to save costs. And now, because of that move, the yield has dropped so sharply, you know, forcing the government to import more food from other parts. So, um, I mean, it's seen as a big joke and farmers are livid. Uh, experts, crop scientists are really critical of the government, but uh, the government would not take uh, any advice on board until the calamity unfolded uh, in the harvest. And now they've reversed the ban. So today the economic crisis is severe. And as I told you, items like milk, rice, dal, um, and several essentials are in short supply or simply unavailable. And even their uh, you know, regular staples like fish, chicken, eggs, everything is expensive it, you know, by over several hundred rupees or thousands of rupees more compared to just two months ago. And even if they are available in the market, the high uh, inflation has made these essential items unaf unaffordable for many. So people are either rationing or skipping their meals, foregoing their cups of tea, standing in long lines for hours for that one can of diesel or kerosene. The fuel shortage has also led to long power cuts, as I told you earlier. So we're experiencing anything between seven to 13 hours of power disruptions every day. Understandably, the public outrage is spilling onto the streets. We have seen a wave of protests across the country asking the Rajapaksas to leave. The anger this time is not from the war-affected Tamils or the persecuted Muslims, but from the country's Sinhalese majority, including those who voted for the Rajapaksas, and therefore this moment is politically significant. Sri Lanka is facing a political impasse too, because the Rajapaksas stubbornly cling on to power, and the opposition is refusing to form an interim government under the president's leadership. The economic crisis is meanwhile worsening, and the government is scheduled to hold talks with the IMF, which brings its own challenges. An IMF program usually comes with strict conditionalities, uh, you know, an increase in taxation, uh, a sharp cut in state spending, which will all affect working people and the poor the most. So that is also going to have political costs for whoever continues in power. I touched upon Sri Lanka's political course in the last decade or so, but its economic trajectory is also very important to our understanding of the current moment. Sri Lanka liberalized its economy in the late 70s, the oldest in the region to do so. The economic policies of subsequent governments have proved consequential. The country's public distribution system and social security measures have been systematically dismantled as governments aggressively privatized and cut state spending on welfare. Only public health and education have survived this time. And Sri Lanka has an enviable public health system even now, uh, as we saw during COVID. Despite the military's uh, involvement in controlling the pandemic, the health sector played a crucial role in ensuring that the spread in rural areas in smaller towns was checked at crucial moments. And uh, Sri Lanka also has pre education up to university now. So, Mahind Rajapaksa, who was two time president and currently the prime minister, beginning 2007, resorted to big loans for mega infrastructure projects, which, you know, many of which are yet to prove commercially viable. And the questions of who they, you know, uh, benefit, whose interests they serve, remain in sharp focus. What's also interesting is there's been a very uh, a scathing political critique of the Rajapaksa time in power. Uh, 
uh, you know, in terms of human rights, civil and political rights, but much less of an economic critique of Rajapaksa because uh, at one level he speaks uh, a language of welfareism, a language of uh, people-centric policies, while also pursuing what could be uh, seen as neoliberal projects. So he defies a neat ideological label in that sense and has somewhat uh, uh, escaped a very sharp economic critique. And conversely, Sri Lanka civil society, perhaps due to the long years of war, has focused almost entirely on civil and political rights. And uh, you know, economic justice has not received as much attention. And what's also uh, significant is the Sri Lankan left, the old left, has aligned itself largely to the Rajapaksas on the plank of an anti-imperialist project. So what we see today is a monumental economic crisis attributed to the Rajapaksa's long denial of an unfolding economic calamity, their apathy, mismanagement, misgovernance, and corruption. But enabling such damaging unilateral decisions of the president is also the system of executive presidency that many now want abolished. From the time I came here first, I have been witness to incessant agitations by mothers of disappeared persons from the North and East, families displaced from their military held lands, families of missing dissidents or youth in the South, key estate workers who protested over three years demanding a fair wage, university students, school teachers, and so on in recent times. But the anti-government protests of today has diverse actors taking part, ordinary citizens, professional bodies of lawyers, doctors, teachers, IT professionals, artists, students, members of the LGBTIQ community, journalists, and so on. They have all united on the specific demand that Rajapaksas resign, taking responsibility for this economic crisis. Some of them who are part of these movements are also trying to see if this moment can be used to start some broader, long pending conversations about authoritarian leaders, about similar Buddhist majoritarianism, repression of minorities, repression of dissidents. It remains to be seen if this resistance can take a larger progressive turn in raising those issues as well. Sri Lanka is definitely at a crossroads. Thank you. Uh, I think that's largely what I meant to convey. And I know that there are some topics of potential interest that I have not touched upon, the geopolitical dimension, the fallout of the Easter attacks and the pursuit of justice that's intensifying now and anything else that you might be curious about, I'll be very happy to respond to your questions and I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mira. Very comprehensive, really. Uh, so we've covered a lot of ground and I'm sure there'll be questions. So can we have some questions from the audience, from our students, basically? Some of them have already done uh, critical international issues, you know. Okay. Uh, yeah, you know they. Yeah. So I don't know if they did Sri Lanka. I have no idea. So, any questions, guys? Can I go? Ahead? Yeah. Please. So, uh, hi, Mira. So, in your article uh, today, uh, you have mentioned that. Uh, 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 still Rajapaksa are in majority in parliament, though even though that 41 members are sitting uh, independently in parliament. So do you think he will be impeached uh, in the uh, very near time or uh, even though if he is impeached or resigned, what next? If Sajit Premadasa comes to power, he has any model to solve this economic crisis or anything, any other scope? Thank you, Sai Charan. Very valid and uh, pertinent question. So, um, as you said, uh, Rajapaksas, they, it's not like they still have the majority, but it's, uh, it's complicated because the opposition also doesn't yet have a very clear majority. And in, in the event that they actually want to uh, table a motion, say a no, confident motion, no confidence motion or any other uh, intervention in parliament, uh, for them to have a simple majority, they will necessarily need some or all of these 42 MPs sitting independently to support them. 
So that itself comes with a political cost because we are talking of uh, MPs from a widely unpopular, discredited government. So any uh, initiative by the opposition, along with some of these actors, is already going to lose credibility in the public eye, right? So that is one thing. So in terms of impeachment, uh, it's not so straightforward because uh, impeachment of the president is impossible without a two-thirds majority and the Supreme Court hearing that's favorable to the motion. So that is going to take time because two-thirds, it's still some way off for the opposition to muster. And uh, uh, in terms of a no-confidence motion, should the opposition uh, be able to mobilize that many votes in, you know, with support from uh, renegade government MPs, uh, what it can best do is have the prime minister go and the cabinet dissolved, right? But that again gives the president powers to appoint any prime minister and cabinet of his choice if he thinks they command the majority. So essentially it, it could just result in a reshuffling of uh, existing actors and uh, voter bias still continuing at the helm. So that is not going to satisfy uh, the public who are very clearly demanding that he resign. And to your second question, say something happens in the event somehow the numbers work, their magic, and the Rajapaksas are out. Sajid Premadasa will come to their helm, yes. But uh, uh, the main uh, consensus of the opposition is also that Sri Lanka should go to the IMF immediately and uh, start conversations about restructuring its external debt. Except IMF support will also amount perhaps to a couple of billions at the moment. And it will only be a very sort of short term measure, but coming with very stringent conditionalities, as I mentioned. So for any political party that uh, has to be in power, it's going to make them hugely unpopular because of how the IMF policies will translate on the ground. So this would also need, I mean, according to economists who are not subscribing to the mainstream consensus of IMF, are also saying it's a time to reflect on the larger economic policy of Sri Lanka, bring back more social security, universal social security, restore some of those you know, welfare programs. But we don't know if uh, you know, Sajid Premadasa or any other leader will have the conviction and the courage to bring about these changes. Yeah. OK, three students have raised their hands. Uh, shall we begin with Malavika? Uh, yes. Can we see you, Malavika? Uh, Ma'am, actually, my internet connection is a little unstable, okay. so I don't want to lose. Yeah. Right. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, Ma'am, uh, you just mentioned that lawyers also took part in protests um, in the past week. So, I just that got me to thinking: what has been the court's reaction to the economic crisis and the behavior of the government towards it? Uh, because like you mentioned, when it comes to impeachment, you need to for its majority. And... I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, I'm sorry, Marika, yeah, I just, didn't catch the last yeah, I'll part. Just, I'll just repeat it. One second. Uh, I, was, uh, I was wondering that what has been the court's reaction to uh, the economic crisis in Sri Lanka? Uh, and as you also mentioned that impeachment requires two-third majority. And so that would just mean, I mean, it's, it's not like an easy process. And I was wondering where does the court stand in all of this? Like, what have they been saying? Are they independent courts, or it? not? Yeah, courts, courts, yeah. Well, um, during the years that the Rajapaksas are in power, the courts are not particularly known for their independence. Right. But there have been very important exceptions to that generalization as well. So uh, on the economic crisis itself, there are a few FR petitions that have been filed at the Supreme Court uh, and a few other cases going on, but there has been no sort of decisive ruling yet, except uh, a leave to proceed or a sort of stay order on a petition challenging the emergency curfew and social media ban that uh, Rajapaksa brought about last weekend and uh, has since restored them. So that has been really only the uh, the only uh, response from the court right now, and these haven't uh, begun uh, sort of playing out in the courts yet. It's still in this very sort of public open domain where people are out on the streets and playing out a little more in parliament now. 
So that's what we are seeing. The courts uh, are yet to intervene. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Uh, let's get uh, Divya Kriti. And you know, when you ask the question, it would be very good if you switched on your camera. Divya Kriti? Ma'am, ma ma I'm actually logged in through my phone. I won't be able to switch on the camera, the image. Okay. Right. Uh, Ma'am, actually, uh, you mentioned about uh, the IMF. I wanted to know whether right now it's feasible to uh, implement what uh, the Washington consensus in Sri Lanka with all its, um, the IMF usually prescribes these uh, guidelines to go by when they give out loans, right? Would it be f uh, feasible to uh, implement those in Sri Lanka at this point? Yeah, like I mentioned, the IMF program will come with conditions and Sri Lanka has a long history of engaging with the IMF. Uh, if I'm not wrong, about 16 times they've gone to the IMF and uh, the conditions are going to be uh, stringent in terms of uh, uh, increase in taxation and cut in state spending. We might see a, you know, a series of uh, efforts to privatize state enterprises that are deemed uh, failures. So all that could happen. And at the moment, uh, even IMF talks are postponed or rather they are, you know, they are pending uh, clarity on who the finance minister of Sri Lanka is. Because uh, after the cabinet stepped down last weekend, the president appointed the former justice minister to the portfolio of finance, but he tendered his resignation later only to tell parliament yesterday that he's still finance minister. So we are in this mess and nobody wants to take that uh, chair but uh, you need a finance minister to begin negotiations but uh, interestingly the president has appointed uh, an advisory panel of experts former central bankers economists who are very credible names to advise him at this time but it uh, but the president uh, is not known to take on good advice in time so let's see thank you okay. yeah uh, Rith, yeah, go ahead. Um, I had a question about foreign policy and how much of Chinese um, investment in Sri Lanka has actually affected the economy. Um, because as I did a little bit of reading and China invested heavily in some ports, which also don't seem to be create, generating a lot of revenue. So, and I'm sure we all know that uh, China generally, their foreign policy has been extremely invasive in terms of economic help in both Southeast Asia as well as Africa. So, and this is our closest neighbor that China's actually invested a lot of money into. So how does it affect both um, Sri Lanka and to a larger extent, India? Right. Thank you for that question, Rick. Uh, it's it's uh, a very sort of prevalent concern in India and in the West, uh, the role of China in Sri Lanka. So uh, to start with, uh, there is this uh, popular trope of a Chinese debt trap in Sri Lanka, and uh, which is especially common in Indian media and Western media. So um, yeah. Chinese loans constitute only about 10% of Sri Lanka's total foreign debt to start with. And China is not Sri Lanka's top creditor. Uh, Sri Lanka has uh, borrowed heavily from the international money market uh, through what's called international sovereign bonds that are high interest. And much of the repayments that are due now are in fact to service these pending loans of international sovereign bonds. At the same time, we have to problematize uh, Chinese investment in Sri Lanka because of exactly the point you raised, that they haven't proved commercially viable, they have not generated employment in a significant way, and the control, control by Chinese state-backed companies is also something that is of strategic relevance, right? Uh, conversely, if you look at Indian investment, uh, there has you know, the contest is no secret, the geopolitical contest. And sometimes it's, um, uh, you know, uh, it plays out very starkly. So for example, last year, Sri Lanka cleared uh, a Chinese energy project in islands of Jaffna Peninsula. But India intervened and said, hey, look, we don't want Chinese projects to come so close to our coast. We'll do the projects for you. And they have more recently won the project. 
But what's also interesting is uh, China had originally won that project through an international competitive bid backed by the Asian Development Bank. So there are questions about due process coming up, uh, you know, as, with regard to different investors here, foreign investors. More recently, uh, India's Adani Group signed contracts to execute major renewable energy projects in the northern parts of Sri Lanka. And mind you, this is not a bilateral government project, but the Adani Group got in without any competitive bid, without floating a tender. They were just here as the government's nominee, according to the Sri Lankan government. So on the one hand, yes, Chinese investments have proved problematic and have proved, uh, you know, they are questionable in many ways. But let's also look at this more holistically in terms of how different international actors are trying to play their game in Sri Lanka. Uh, but also important to mention that India has been big on grants in Sri Lanka. One of uh, their biggest grant projects has been in Sri Lanka, especially the 50,000 houses built for war-affected Tamils in the North and East and Hill Country Tamils. So it's, it's a more complicated story than just uh, you know, Chinese loans versus others. And I'd also like to uh, touch a little upon, you know, what also determines uh, Sri Lanka's choices. So especially when a uh, nationalist government like the Rajapaksas are in power, they, uh, you know, they are averse to IMF programs or at least they are reluctant because uh, it, it, it'll interfere with their populist uh, outreach, right? Their populist policies. They are uh, skeptical of any Western help because it will come with political conditionalities like human rights and so on. That also puts them in trouble. So they you know, resort to uh, a lender who will not ask too many questions, but still give you the money. And in a way that uh, could be said it was the rationale for different governments, not just the Rajapaksas to borrow heavily from China. At the same time, as I said, we also have to ask uh, uh, important questions about how India is investing in Sri Lanka, who are representing India and in what way. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we'll take a question from Ashish Tiwari. Yeah. yeah Hello, ma'am. Yeah. So my question is, do people out the protest, people who are protesting out there uh, see the opposition as uh, a political alternative? And if they do, do you see them coming together? Right. Credible Again, political thanks. alternative. Right. Thank you, Ashish. Very, very relevant and important question. At the moment, uh, the public, the mass public protests uh, have not indicated that they have any faith in the opposition. The opposition lacks credibility in, you know, uh, among most Sri Lankans. They have been quite unassertive, unassertive these two years. They've been very reactive and not necessarily challenging the government when it came to important policies, right? Um, I remember this uh, op-ed that uh, very she, a senior political scientist, Professor Jayadeva Uyanguda wrote for the Hindu some time ago when Gota by Rajapaksa finished two years. He said, uh, you know, this unassertive and weak opposition remains the Rajapaksa's main political asset. Even as incumbency was setting in, this, uh, you know, weak opposition was uh, proving a political asset to the Rajapaksa. So, so in that, the protests, the people's protests and the political opposition's uh, resistance have not converged yet. We don't know if that might happen in the weeks uh, going forward. But um, it's also going to be difficult to sustain these spontaneous protests. That's the general reading here. Uh, because without political backing, it's possible that they fizzle out or they lack direction. And it's harder to push that line uh, into an actual political challenge. So um, yes, uh, they haven't converged yet, but we don't know if that might happen going forward. We're expecting large protests this weekend at Colombo's seafront this evening and tomorrow. And it's possible that both the political opposition and uh, general public culminate there, but we have to see, I don't know yet. Okay, thank you, Mira. And uh, Pranay Rajiv, uh, yeah, you can ask your question. Uh, hi, man. Uh, so most of the visuals we see from the protests are from, uh, usually from Colombo. So what is the state of the status of the protest in uh, Tamil dominated areas, Muslim dominated areas? Is it uniform? Uh, what is the status? Right. So um, the protests have 
largely dominated the southern areas, at least in their initial stages, uh, significantly not just in Colombo, but in other parts of the south as well, even in districts where the Rajapaksas are immensely popular. But there are now protests both in the north and east where Tamils are, and uh, uh, people are also asking questions as they protest, because protesting is not new to the north and east, they've had to protest for various reasons that I mentioned. But Tamil parliamentarians and some Tamil activists are asking these questions on social media in parliament, uh, appealing to their Sinhalese counterparts, saying, see, the Rajapaksas have let you down. Do you now appreciate what it was like for us to brave their policies all these years, brave that sort of discrimination? And some parliamentarians are asking if this can be that moment when the Sinhalese uh, can appreciate Tamil concerns more and perhaps unite in a call for a larger, uh, you know, change. So the protests are picking up in the North and East, but with these questions also emerging from them. Um, so uh, is there a possibility of this turning into an ethnical angle? Uh, is there a potential for an ethnical angle emerging out of this protest? Uh, not at the moment, I don't see that yet. Uh, because people are not raising ethnic questions in a dominant way. People are just basically demanding that the Rajapaksas resign. And this protest is speaking to this very immediate, uh, you know, a crisis of people not having uh, cooking gas, not having milk at home, not having rice. So it's at that level that they are out on the streets. So I don't think it will take an ethnic turn very soon unless there's active sort of uh, political uh, intervention or people decide to give it, uh, uh, you know, a different focus. Uh, okay. Shreya, I'll get Shreya Basu Roy to speak. Yeah. Yes, uh, yes ma'am. Uh, so ma'am, my question is, uh, can you just throw a light on uh, the role of IEMF in the entire economic crisis? And I mean, if Sri Lanka is again planning to borrow from I IEMF again, Right. Uh, uh, as I told you, the conversations are yet to begin in a, in a full-fledged way because I think the IMF would also await clarity on who the finance minister is to lead the negotiations. Uh, like They say that the talks could take a couple of months to um, you know, firm up uh, the program and say in a couple of months, there's some support coming in from the IMF. It would likely amount to uh, a few billion dollars, but we, it won't be a bailout or it can't rescue Sri Lanka. It can provide some interim support uh, at best. But again, with these conditionalities, it's going to have other repercussions for people of the country. Uh, on the IMF itself, I would uh, direct you to a very, very informative piece that uh, Professor Ram Kumar from Tata Institute of Social Sciences recently wrote in the Hindu, basically tracking Sri Lanka's engagement with the IMF over the years and what it has meant for the economy. So maybe I can compile a few links uh, and uh, send it to Dr. Rajan for um, circulation to the class if that would be useful. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Mira. Uh, before I come to the others, I just want to read out a, a note from our Afghan student, uh, Ajwal uh, Jalalzai, who's asked a question uh, of you, Mira. I, uh, or maybe it's just a comment. I think the government of Sri Lanka must tackle this problem as India did in the 1991 financial crisis. It can go to IMF for emergency credit and also implement the structural as well as uh, macroeconomic reforms to overcome the situation. I don't know what you have to say to that. Thank you, Ajmal. In fact, a lot of Sri Lankans are also comparing this moment with the early 90s in India and saying we'd love for a savior like Manmohan Singh to uh, rescue our economy. But if you ask, uh, you know, economists and uh, people in India, there are very mixed uh, responses to what this period and this project of liberalization has meant for India itself. So on the one hand, you see privatization, a certain form of development taking off. Uh, on the other, you also see how inequality has risen in the period, what happened to people, what happened to working people, and so on. So I don't think there is a, a consensus that 
and IMF and structural reforms thereafter uh, in a certain uh, uh, project necessarily benefits the entire country, but uh, that's subject to debate. Okay, so uh, we have Rishika Singh, and then I'll come to Sai Sharan, okay? So Rishika, do ask your question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the information that you gave out. I was wondering what is the role of the executive presidency system that's there in Sri Lanka because it's different from a, a you know, simple presidential or prime ministerial system. So does that affect things? And I was reading that you know some parties have said that the system also needs to go. But what is the link between the system and the economic crisis that's taking over? Right. So uh, Sri Lanka in its post-independence history has you know, different leaders have promised to abolish executive presidency, but forgotten the promise just after being elected because that's how addictive that seat is. The sweeping powers that the president has in this country, uh, you know, the kind of decisions the president is empowered to take without being challenged, um, you know, makes it a formidable uh, chair for anybody aspiring to be in power. So in that now, um, whether it was Gota by Rajapaksa's uh, chemical fertilizer ban, or even this push to restore, uh, you know, more powers for the president through the 20th Amendment, all these are a reflection of this sort of, uh, you know, uh, power concentration in one office. So that has its risks because everything depends on this person's personality, whim, uh, you know, and self-interest, right? I mean, nothing else drives power more than self-interest. So Sri Lanka has paid a heavy price. And even the constitutional crisis that I mentioned from 2018, when President Sirisena at that time sacked his prime minister was only possible because of this executive presidential system. So um, uh, historically uh, and in contemporary politics as well, an executive president has been able to get away with really problematic decisions and policies without challenge because of how how much that office is protected in the constitution okay thank you yeah okay so uh, there's sai sharan and then i'll follow it with ajay ajay tomar i think yeah uh, since the end of the uh, civil war in sri lanka in 2009 after that also uh, tamil minorities have been uh, uh, constantly discriminated and persecuted and uh, there are reports that uh, people who are living in the coastal areas from Kilino, Chimuliti, or uh, Yadpanam, they are coming to uh, the, our coastal areas, basically Rameshwaram, uh, Tarangambadi, Nagapatram, these areas. Once they reach here, they'll be put in a rehabilitation center or detention camp. Some of our friends from ACJ also covered those uh, uh, rehabilitation camps, and these camps are also not good. And uh, the accessibility for those camps also not uh, that much good. And as a journalist, we are not able to cover this properly. So since these people are constantly under a human rights violation, so how should we go about it? And what do you think India should do now uh, to save this crisis, to save people from this crisis? Okay. Uh, I'll try to respond to this question in two parts. One is about uh, you know people leaving in the current circumstances and going to Tamil Nadu. I think. Uh, even yesterday, four people have gone, and earlier, 16 uh, people from Jaffna had gone by boat to Rameshwaram. And uh, my colleague had reported how this is uh, proving quite uh, difficult for authorities because, uh, you know, by international conventions and laws, you can't readily call them refugees, I believe, if they are escaping economic distress. So there are administrative uh, complications in that as well. And uh, in regard to refugee camps, yes, uh, even in my reporting days in India, I found it hard to get into camps as a journalist and um, report on developments there. But more recently, I think the Tamil Nadu Chief Minister uh, Stalin has announced uh, a big policy package for refugees. And that was welcomed very much by uh, you know, uh, refugee groups, as well as the Tamil political leadership here and diaspora groups. So uh, at the same time, you know, I've heard uh, people who've tried to come back here also feel quite disillusioned because they're returning to a situation where their futures are so uncertain. And there are very like basic uh, problems, like, you know, if they were to get a degree in India, those certificates are not considered valid here. So there are lots of logistics related and administrative problems. 
And of the 16 people that went to Tamil Nadu two weeks ago, escaping this crisis, four, four of them had returned from refugees ca refugee camps to Sri Lanka only in 2016. And they already went back. So it's quite distressing to hear this sort of, um, you know, feeling alienated both there and on their return here. Uh, what can India do? Uh, your second part is now after the civil war ended and after those uh, early years, uh, India's priority uh, has definitely shifted to its geostrategic concerns, right? I mean, okay, the civil war is over and now uh, it, it appears that India is more focused on countering Chinese influence, not just in Sri Lanka, but in the Maldives, Bangladesh, and so on. So um, there is definitely a shift in that foreign policy, although uh, the Indian establishment keeps reiterating its uh, demand for a political solution, for justice and equality for all Sri Lankans and so on. So, um, I mean, India will every now and then use the Tamil issue as leverage, uh, comment on it, perhaps maneuver within the UN Human Rights Council. But I really think for a lasting uh, political solution to come uh, and address all those pending questions from the years of war, uh, the change has, has to come within Sri Lanka. There's external actors have uh, uh, serious limits to what they can achieve here, given also their other priorities, right? How will India balance its concern for Tamils and its concern about uh, Chinese influence in Sri Lanka. So in that sense, you know, unless uh, the Tamil cause is taken up by the entire country, uh, progressive Sinhalese, uh, working people, everybody, I don't think there's going to be a lasting solution uh, based on an external intervention. Okay, thank you, Mira, for that. And uh, Ajay, you, uh, can we see you? Yeah, ask your question, Ajay Tomar. Hello, mom. I want to ask that with all the international aid provided to Sri Lanka now by India and other nations, like who is keeping a check on its fair and equal distribution to people in the nation? Like is government again, the same government which put people in crisis, is it again monitoring that or is judiciary also playing a role? How is it? Uh, thank you, Ajay. Uh, the short answer to your question is nobody is monitoring that. Um, yeah. The government has full control of how it's managing the funds that are coming in. Judiciary doesn't have a role, but uh, I mean, the government also knows that if the uh, funds that are coming in are not immediately distributed uh, by way of essentials or fuel, people are only going to be more angry. So every time, uh, you know, they want to respond to this public rage, they really count on this new fuel shipment from India or something else from somewhere else to sort of pacify uh, public that are protesting. But uh, there is no systematic uh, account keeping that is at least transparent that we are privy to. So um, all this will be a question in terms of who handled the funds, how and how much of it actually went to people and people who needed it the most. So you, you know, in our, uh, you know, South Asian context, corruption is a prevalent issue and Every time there's access to something during times of scarcity, we see that it services the rich and influential most, right? So that can't be ruled out here as well. Ma'am, I also want to know that uh, with people being deprived of food and essentials in these days, do you see a possible intervention of international human rights organizations, UN or other organizations, or are they still intervening in the near future? Well, the UN has been commenting on developments here and they say they are watching closely, but in terms of actual assistance, it's unclear that they are uh, providing anything substantial yet. So uh, at the moment, uh, uh, Sri Lanka has obtained about $2.4 billion from India since the beginning of this year. And then uh, from the time the pandemic broke out, China extended $2.8 billion and uh, Sri Lanka has asked them for a further $2.5 billion. So at the moment, these two uh, bilateral lenders are the main players. And of course, IMF conversations are going to begin and later uh, you know, talks with the World Bank are due. Uh, we have to see how uh, this uh, you know, uh, pans out. Thank you. Okay, Akshit, go ahead. <clears throat> 
So my, my first question is, uh, how did the Sri Lanka's uh, government experiment of organic farming went wrong and worsen the crisis? And the second question is, why did country issued uh, sovereign bonds uh, without making a provision for repayment? Right. So the answer to your first question is that, uh, uh, you know, this green agriculture is, is a, a, a popular, uh, you know, pet theme for many leaders including in India now. So in fact, when uh, Sri Lankan side and India held bilateral discussions recently, uh, Sri Lanka's former finance minister was in Delhi in December and uh, met uh, uh, Modi. One of the talking points was this transition to green agriculture. So there's something uh, you know, going on with these big leaders and their uh, fascination for uh, organic farming. But at the same time, uh, uh, you know, if you look at countries in Europe or uh, other contexts where this has actually worked, uh, you know, it, uh, it's taken decades, this transition from traditional chemical fertilizer based farming, which was a consequence to green revolution to address starvation and, you know, increase productivity. The transition from that to organic farming has taken decades in many countries. So trying to do this overnight was, uh, definitely a huge blunder, a policy blunder. I mean, he wanted to make a statement, but it came with heavy costs because uh, Sri Lankan scientists, agriculture scientists, crop scientists told him, don't do this because it's going to impact production. So what happens is, this is like, I mean, I'm giving you a very sort of, uh, 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 it may not be right in terms of actual facts, but just to give you an example, this is like you're looking at somebody who has been on steroids for a long time. And one day you say, take an Ayurvedic pill, you'll be fine the next day, right? So that kind of a transition. So the crops are now failing farmers and uh, Sri Lanka had uh, achieved self-sufficiency in paddy production just a few years ago. And today we are talking about a potential 50% drop in harvest. So imagine the kind of uh, consequences this can have on people because rice is staple here. Sri Lankans eat rice every day, right? So um, it's, it's already playing out in the drop in harvest and it's going to force Sri Lanka to import more rice. And actually this weekend, uh, a big consignment of rice is due from India as part of a line of credit. So basically Sri Lanka is paying for rice, which it was able to grow a couple of years ago paying for rice at a time when it has very little money or no money. So that's where it is. And your uh, second question about why Sri Lanka went on to uh, borrow through international sovereign bonds. Well, um, as I said, after the liberalization project began in the 70s, there has been an extensive push for large scale mega infrastructure seen in ports, airports, expressways, and uh, all governments, I mean, including Rajapaksa's including uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe's UNP government, uh, and even earlier before that, all governments have resorted to uh, these uh, borrowings, but it was actually uh, intensified during uh, Mahindra Rajapaksa's first and second term as president, because um, that sort of big capital coming into the country was really um, you know, his uh, initiative beginning 2007. So to show a sort of mini boom in the post-war years, so if you look at Sri Lanka's growth rates just after the war, it was around 8% and it seemed very impressive from the outside, but it really didn't translate to actual uh, benefits or jobs or development that people could uh, take part of. Okay, thank you. Uh, Meera, uh, there's one more uh, question from Sri Dev Krishna Kumar. Yeah, uh, hi ma'am. Uh, so as you said also, Sinhalese Buddhist monks have had a significant influence over the Sri Lankan society. We have seen them in the past leading mobs against Muslims, Tamil community. Uh, so what has been their role in these protests? Because a day ago, I saw this clip of a Sinhalese mob, uh, mob, mob among being uh, shooed away by a protester because he had uh, supported Rajiv Paksa in the last elections. So is their influence declining and are they playing any role in these protests? Yes, uh, the, the clip that you refer to went viral here for that reason. This is a popular monk in Colombo, known for his support to the Rajapaksas being shouted at. And if you saw that gentleman, you know, fell at his feet and said, please leave our protest site. We don't want you here. 
So it was a very telling comment on how uh, some Sri Lankans are beginning to view Buddhist clergy who are very politically significant and influential here. Um, also, there are uh, dissident Buddhist monks, even within Sri Lanka, who have been part of other progressive movements. But you're right in saying that, uh, you know, the uh, mainstream uh, or the most influential Sinhala Buddhist clergy have sought to uh, uh, further the nationalist uh, majoritarian project and they're accorded a very important place by all political parties. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know, I, that, that clip suggested that there is growing skepticism and perhaps even emerging hate for these figures, but we don't know how widely that sentiment is shared and whether it will be sustained after the economic crisis. Yeah. Any more questions? Anyone else has any question? Uh, anyway, you all know that uh, once this is over, we, you know, Mira, there's another uh, uh, lecture, na you know, by Nandan Oni Krishnan, uh, that's on the Ukraine-Russian crisis. Okay, okay. Yeah, so that's the next session at oh, 11. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That should be so interesting too. It should be, do you want, if you want to join, you're most welcome to. We'll send you the Thank link. You. Okay, I'll ask uh, Srinivasan to send you the link. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I definitely try to, but I think I'll also have to cover some protests today, but if I'm able to, I'll be... If you're able really to, that'll be great. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. any questions, people? Any more? Any other comments? Anything? Uh, so, anyway... I, I just saw a comment yeah. in the chat box uh, from Arun, who yeah. says it is... Yeah, Arun, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it will probably need the Consortium of Nations to bail Sri Lanka out. Uh, well, actually, that's one proposal coming from the former Prime Minister Anil Vikramasinghe. He's asked for an aid consortium. Uh, and yeah, Sri Lanka, we need more than one source of help. And they have to explore all possibilities and uh, weigh the conditions that come with uh, assistance from different people. Yeah, yeah. that's right, Arun. Yeah. So that is, yeah, that's, that's, uh, it's true because, uh, but what happened, Greece was also accused of being too socialist and too much of a welfare state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's right. Yeah. That, that's... So, I mean, so Sri Lanka is going slightly the, in the opposite direction. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway. Um... Um, yeah, but, uh, so uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so Shashi is just saying that, you know, just to say it was an excellent session. So Shashi is Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Anyway, but Meera, honestly, thank you so much for patiently and meticulously answering all the questions and also for your very, very comprehensive uh, lecture, uh, you know, your presentation. That was really, very useful. And I'm sure it has helped uh, our students because, you know, this is our neighbor. And many people say, are we going to go the Sri Lankan way, except that we are not dependent on tourism the way Sri Lanka is, isn't it? So we are not exclusively, I mean, dependent on that. So, uh, and with the and, long, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, just to add, Dr. Rajan, that... Uh... I really appreciated the questions and the range of questions in terms of themes and topics uh, um, everybody has covered because, you know, uh, there is a frustration within Sri Lanka that the mainstream Indian media largely looks at Sri Lanka through this China lens and, uh, you know, they don't have much appetite for what's happening within Sri Lanka and what Sri Lankans may be concerned about. So um, in a way, this is so heartening to see questions ranging from, you know, human rights and legal consequences and constitutional prospects and, you know, the whole gamut. So very, very uh, heartening. So thank you for all the thoughtful questions. Uh, our students are also, you know, because they, they are interested in foreign affairs, in um, international issues, because they have that elective and many people are interested in that. And that's also why our students have shown a great deal of interest in what you've had to say. So thank you, Mira. I know how busy you are. And um, we were supposed to have it in the evening, right? 
and you were unable to do it in the evening. So we no, thank you for rescheduling. This worked really well. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, but we are very, very grateful that you're here and uh, you've spoken to our students. You've enlightened all of us uh, in many ways. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mira. Thank you, Mira. Okay. And uh, we'll, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure uh, uh, there, uh, perhaps other people may just want to also ask you questions later on. And it shouldn't be, is it okay if they were to just send email. you an email or uh, some email? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. So we, I can share the, your mail. Or would you be able to just put it in the chat, Mira? Yes, I'll do that right away. problem. I mean, I know that you're busy. No, no, no. I'm happy to respond. Sometimes uh, a little late, if not immediately, but... Yeah, yeah. Whenever you have that. I mean, you know, because... And if there are a group of people who would like to just chat about what's going on here at a later point, we can have uh, another Zoom discussion as well. It doesn't have to be a talk talk, but uh, that yeah, might also... An work. informal thing, you know, with the students. Yeah. Of course, of course. Well, here you have it. Yeah, miras.srinivasan at the hindu.co.n. So thank you, Mira. And once you. again, and you, from, of, you know, thank you from the Asian College of Journalism, as well as from all our students, I'm sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, just a note to all the students that we log out of this session, but at 1130, there's another session, uh, Nandan Unikrishan. That's a fantastic session too on... Uh, the Ukraine Russian crisis, and this is a veteran, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, he know, he understands Russia. He's been working on that for, uh, these topics for a very long time. Okay, so you've got the, all the coordinates, the Zoom coordinates, and we'll see you there. Thank you, thank you all for being here.